but welcome everybody to the impact stage of Texylvania. Um, today we have Newton Howard in this session. Dr. Newton Howard's career spans academia, the US military and the private sector. A prolific scientific author and inventor, he is highly skilled in moving research from the lab to military and commercial applications, including technology you may use daily, such as Siri, Wi-Fi hotspots, Skype, Google Earth, and Google Translate. A former government scientist, Dr. Howard is a professor of computational neuroscience and neurosurgery at the University of Oxford and Georgetown University, and the former director of the Synthetic Intelligence Lab at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Dr. Newton is the founder of NI2O Inc., which is developing a novel artificial intelligence-driven brain-computer interface to treat a wide range of debilitating neurological disorders and to improve cognitive performance. He also founded and sits on the board of two nonprofits, the Howard Brain Sciences Foundation, which funds innovative research initiatives to improve our understanding of the human brain, and C4ADS, which is dedicated to providing data-driven analysis and evidence-based reporting on global conflict and transnational security issues. Speaking today on human brain impact and future, please welcome Dr. Newton Howard to Texylvania 2020. Thank you very much, Travis, for this great introduction. Um, the topic of today is the future of the brain and uh, the introduction into the, uh, this topic uh, takes us to time of Aristotle and Plato alike when uh, the brain was a question of investigation as a seat of conscience and uh, as the organ uh, of thinking, uh, leading to migrating uh, or concluding that uh, the brain and the heart and the gut is where actually these faculties preside. Uh, over the last several years, there haven't been a substantial uh, leaps into discovering uh, how the operation of the brain or uh, advancing uh, what we know about it from 2000 years ago, almost. As such that we learned at some point in time that the brain is an electrical machine and a chemical machine. Uh, the only novel thing in this century is that we discovered also that it is amenable and susceptible to light. And I will explain that briefly it was in the context of uh, disease disorder. Um, when we try to model the size of the brain of the prefrontal cortex, we need the equivalent of a uh, power plant, essentially. And um, the chemicals that we use today to, for treatment is wide and broad, but it has no targeting. It's, um, I'm on slide three, I'm not sure if I was actually able to share this, uh, but let's say that most of the uh, treatment methods, uh, you use one thing and something else uh, breaks. The brain, you know, consists of a number of unexplained continents and it's a great stretch of unknown territories. Uh, you know, that's uh, Kegel back in 1852 uh, suggested that. So in order to actually develop new ways of intervention for these disorders, it required first and foremost, a strong theoretical framework to understand the healthy brain function and a brain capacity for action. This multi-model of information exchange in biological systems with the key uh, focus of our investigation as a team in the multiple labs that I worked on. So at MIT, for example, we looked at the nature of intelligence and how is uh, intelligence that are forged and fabricated and growing um, synthetically. And uh, followed that work by uh, looking at the communication between the neuronal, you know, the neuronal um, junctions, interfaces, and the dendrites. But we didn't have a common language to understand how this communication take place. So we started looking for the Morse code of the brain, uh, AKA language of the brain. And we discovered that there's a common substrate language, like assembly language, essentially the computer for the brain. 
that assembly languages enables these vast territories to communicate with each other in a very efficient and effective manner. But still comes the currency of that exchange. Is it uh, light? Is it electric? Uh, is it chemical? And the conclusion that it's all of the above. So we wanted to push that envelope a little bit further and say, can we build an in silico interface, another word, a resemblance of another brain inside the brain that fulfill the gap in, and, address the, in, and address and correct some of the disease disorder uh, state. Um, we then proceeded to the production of what is known now as the Kiwi chip uh, that has a small placement into the brain. And in the case of the experimentation, for experimentation purposes, what we did, place it in the subthalamic nucleus. It is a small uh, electronic package that is positioned in the dura uh, and positioned also up to layer five with a massive therapeutic impact. It is minimally invasive. We made sure that it has the criteria of a wireless connectivity, as well as made from a material that is accepted by the brain, like carbon nanotubes, and uh, communicate to the outside world the mystery of the brain from the outside in. At that junction, actually, we would have to explain two things. One is that this classes of technology is known as BCI, and the second class of technology known as GPS. BCI is a non-intrusive in nature, while DPS is intrusive in nature, and both of them serve for a significant contribution to the therapeutic factor uh, of the brain. It was also important to have a technology that is chronic and actually going to last for the duration of the life cycle of the patient. Uh, so we addressed it by having a way to load software on the air and uh, ways to actually improve the functionality internally by the internal code of the system. As a result of this work, we were able to actually operate on a number of uh, hundreds of patients with Parkinson and get the result that was desired for, which is the restoration of movement uh, function and movement disorder. We were able to actually use the decipher platform, the non-intrusive platform, for alleviating anxiety, depression, and some other indications. The key components of this uh, field of investigation was substantially benefited from understanding what we refer to as the fundamental code unit. So the fundamental code unit is essentially the assembly language of the brain. An assembly language of the brain is constructed in such a simplistic way with unitary mathematics that carries the efficiency that we were not able to see in the cognitive throughput, maximum cognitive throughput of the brain with a very minimum amount of electricity, 40 watts. The mystery of the brain continues as one of the least investigated items in the universe and one of the most curious resemblance to the universe. To put it in perspective, we are approximately 4 billion neurons in calculation with 10,000, 10 to the power of 10, 10 to the minus 16 of uh, the distance between here and a known universe. That is the brain that we each carry. The capabilities of this brain to heal itself and to address issues beyond the grasp of the very person that carries the brain boggles the minds, the issues of duality. With that being said, I want to leave you with the thought that the human brain of the future will not be the human brain that we have right now. It will be the evolved back to restore the de-evolution of the brain over our centuries. And with that, I would tell you that our goal is to actually restore the human dignity that was being taken by disease and malfunctions of the DNA. Thank you for listening and I cannot take questions. Hey guys, I'm here. So uh, there's a question from Alex. Is that okay if we take it? The question from Alex, the one Yeah, I said, can you recommend uh, any books on the subject of inner workings uh, of how the brain works? I recommend uh, Hofstadter and Bradley. Uh, these are the two authors that have the most prophetic work on the inner working and the mechanical, quantum mechanical way of expressing it. 
Ben Roth has a paper on uh, uh, Ben Roth of Oxford. He's a physicist, and he has a brain uh, discussion around the quantum uh, properties of the brain. Cool. Um, did you, would you like to take some more questions right now? Or sure. Yes, bring cool. it on. So, guys, <laughs> if you have any more questions, we're going to do some questions. Please leave them in the chat. Um, I will uh, ask them as they come in. Um, but uh, in the meantime, um, while they wait to, to write their questions, um, I guess we can, we can just talk as they type because it, 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 it's a little faster to talk than type, right? Uh, Ruben uh, asked, how, um, how the existing fMRI techniques can contribute to the human brain of the future? Or should there, uh, or should there be developed novel fMRI techniques? So my outlook on fMRI and MRI that these are useless tools um, and what needs to happen is actually understand how the inner working of the brain at the structural, functional, and behavioral level. Meaning that in order to actually have a pristine data uh, for the brain, you actually have to interact with the brain. The spatial temporality of the information flowed all the way to the skull is impacted by uh, barriers and evolutionary controls, if you will, to make sure that the brain is protected. fMRI and MRI looks at the sugar movement, blood movement, and structures and lumps. That's like, might as well should have been invented 2,000 years ago. Okay. Uh, and for, for novices like myself, what is the difference between an fMRI and an MRI? One uh, has a static uh, view okay. that doesn't look at the flow of oxygenation and blood, okay. and fMRI is, uh, looking at the functional view, which is the flow of oxygenation and blood. Okay. And so, and then, so as you're saying for the future of kind of um, whatever the future of the human brain, that sort of thing is, is in your opinion, probably not relevant to um, the kind of complex, I guess. Um, right. I mean, an that. fMRI and an MRI shows me that yeah. there is a brain there. And, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, we're, we're assuming that by the very behavior of the individual. Sometimes we doubt it, but the yeah. MRI will prove it. Yeah, and then, and then to the credit of the MRI and fMRI, what you use, for example, in BAT scan is much better than this too because you're looking at the magnetic field and the distribution of the chemical properties and whatnot. If you actually zoom in and specifically take uh, basal ganglia or uh, hypothalamus or some specific region, then you're able to see atrophies, you're able to see anomalies that is consistent with the disease state. So uh, Justin asks, is there a relationship between cholesterol and brain function? And if so, how significant is it? Very significant. The very fabric of the brain is made out of fatty chains. And fatty chains is essentially a form of cholesterol, the good one. And sometimes a little bit of the bad one. If they have, if you have a uh, liver function, it would impact the healthy growth and replenishment of the brain. The system, the body system as a whole works together to produce a concerto of living. And it's very important that one does not compromise one at the risk of another. So yes, cholesterol is absolutely important and in the amount of replenishment of the brain. Cool, well, thank you, Justin, for that question. We have uh, Lucian. Can you tell us more about the assembly code of the brain? Is it something that can boost AI research using our current computers? Or is, or is it something that only works well because the brain is so complex? So I steer him to the following paper, the brain operating system published this year and the cognitive geometry published this year uh, by me and my colleagues. And there we discuss an infinite point in space where actually think of that as a decision making and the consequential tracks that leads to that construct using graph flow. And this type of concept definitely will help AI significantly. Cool. Thank you, Lucian. So uh, Bogdan has a question. We're just rapid fire here right now. Maybe no okay. problem. Bring it on. Okay, cool. Bring it on. Uh, is one's intelligence limited to his or her genetics or can one improve at it? Uh, drastically. I'm asking this because I recently found out about neuroplasticity and he apologizes if it's a, a ignorant question, but no, hey, man, 
I said, oh. I ask it too. I ask it too. This, this is a very brilliant question. It sits at the heart of nurture and nature. If you have uh, dialectic miscoding in the DNA and the brain or anomalies, does not necessarily mean that this person is going to have a lower IQ. Does not necessarily mean that this person is going to have cognitive capacity that is less than another person. Uh, give a personal example, uh, people with dyslexia. It was thought to be something like, uh, you know, uh, this person is uh, not, not intelligent enough. That's why they can't read. Well, it turns out that after a number of years, most of the intelligent people like Einstein and whatnot had these difficulties. Um, so when you take, when you take anything of the brain and put it in the right environment, you're able to regenerate the circuits. You're able to expand the circuits. The brain plasticity takes over. You can take a 90 years old who's never seen a math in a day of her life, and then you teach him mathematics. A 90 years old. The old assumption is that no, it's not possible. You know, you 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 close. No about new tricks, as they say. Yeah, yeah. So so genetics plays a role, but it isn't what dictates intelligence. Intelligence has many dimensions. We can only catch about 16 of them. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Um, Alexandra has a question. Uh, what is your view on the relationship between AI and ethics, and how do you think this impacts businesses currently? Um, AI and ethics is uh, an interesting area also where we have to look at um, what is the ethical implication of what you produce in AI. So. AI on its own is neither ethical nor unethical. It's simply, it's simply a tool. I have an option to write programs in a, in a uh, controlled manner that is uh, uh, basic languages and whatnot, or I have an option to get a little fancy and use uh, linear algebra and, and machine learning and whatnot. So in the end of the day, the word AI is highly abused um, uh, in, in, as such that it is really a linear algebra you know, predicate calculus, abstract algebra, and uh, graph theories and topology. Uh, that's the composition of the underlying uh, uh, programming that we use. So if you choose one versus the other, you're not committing any ethical violation. Having said that, there should be a committee that actually evaluate the production of uh, AI and see that, that you have uh, you know, construct that represent the moral fabric of what a reason, reasonable human does. Is it reasonable to get people to lose their job? Absolutely not. But if you have another way to compensate, then then there is a trade-off and so forth. Cool. Well, thank you, uh, Alexander, for that question. Uh, Bev asks, which part of the brain is best for predicting behavior? For predicting behavior, it doesn't quite work like that. Um, behavior is a construct of a very complex process that sits on a structure. The structure being the constellation of specific neurons or a network that is formed with a very temporal and specific purpose. If it's a memory recall, if it's uh, an action to move your arm, if it is a volition based action, etc. Then on the top of that, there's a functional processes that it is not understood today for every one of these actions. Then the third layer is the behavior, which is expressed in the outward world and observed. And then after that, you try to make sense of it, but you cannot localize exactly down to the neuron level. The resolution level right now is that you can say, oh yeah, that's the executive function is in the prefrontal lobe and uh, they did planning and organizing. Okay, that's, that's in the PFI. Um, but the PFI is a neighborhood that has got 50 billion neurons. So find the house that produced it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, cool. So Ruben's back with another question. Uh, actually, a two-part question. Uh, is there a specific part of the brain responsible for cognitions? I ask because I'm running now an fMRI study which implies rational, irrational beliefs, uh, and this answer would help would help him. And then he also asks: Carbon nanotubes have other apps than treating Parkinson's? Do carbon nanotubes have other apps? Uh, applications than treating Parkinson's and anxiety slash depression. Sure. 
So to the first question, where does cognition preside in the brain? Um, the sense of agency does not preside in the brain, preside in the mind. Where does the brain preside is similar to the question where conscience is preside. Um, the brain is the seat of conscience and the manufacturer of the mind. It is not, it is not uh, a place that you could say, I am going to put EEG or fMRI or PET scan or MRI, whatever method out there, and I'm going to find what is the origin of conscience. It's not the way to actually find the origin of conscience. Uh, volition and um, sense of agency is what gives us a sense that I recognize I'm here, I recognize I'm a person. A machine has not been able yet to be programmed in such a way that I could say this machine would come back to me and say, I am alive, don't code on me today. I just need a break, right? It doesn't say that. It is not possible to say that. However, it is possible to actually program it as such that it turns off at certain time or rejects a certain task or in the case of Toyota experiment, play violin, but it will not feel the violin. It will play the violin, but it will not feel the violin. A human feels, then play, right? Yeah. So that's one. Uh, and the second question on uh, carbon nanotubes. Um, carbon nanotubes, we uh, evaluated against 168 different indications mm. of the possibility from anything from anxiety, depression, Parkinson, Alzheimer, Huntington, MS, LS, uh, the, whole, the whole gamut. Um, all what it does is just provides a functional interface to the actual neurons so that they can grow on. Okay, well, thank you, Ruben, for those. Uh, yeah, I said thank you very much for your detailed and useful answer, so we really appreciate it. And, and uh, Alexandra's back with the question, what do you think is the biggest limitation of modern neuroscience, especially given the problem it often has with results slash studies replication? So the, the biggest predicament that we have is that um, we're still doing the same thing that we've been doing thousands of years ago. We're still we're still thinking of the brain as a uh, uh, you know biomechanical machine. Okay. It is not. It it is something that has the sophistication of being ten to the minus sixteen distance between here and the known universe. That's the density in a negative integer. It's okay. got ten thousand dendrite to each tree of each one of this uh, one to a billion. It's got quantum property that is able to process light, which is unknown to us. And only recently that we managed to prove that. But we insist on the treatment being chemical compounds that have a number of intumors and isomers that are limited. And we insist that the treatment is based on, uh, you know, uh, electroceutical, where we're pumping, uh, you know, 12 amps or whatever in the brain, two amps, sorry. Uh, and, 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 that's, and that's just a limitation, or TMS, it's a magnetic. That thinking it existed for a very long time. The shift in paradigm has to understand why did evolution put a part of the brain sticking out of the brain, the eyes? Yeah, I mean, I'm not the person to ask that. Uh, both. It's a propositional question. Yeah, they, yeah, because I thought you were looking for an answer for me. No, no, no. It is, it is essentially, is it, it is essentially the brain as a uh, as an evolutionary object sitting in a closed box is reaching toward the light. So we find that neurons known as the retina rod is able to process light on and off switches in addition to processing the images that are responsible for us, our sight. Okay. The rest of the neurons in the evolutionary box or an object are not doing that so, but we are able to actually introduce something called a vector or a virus and cause the virus to re-express the DNA such that the, the brain actually inside the closed box is processing light to the density of 10 to the minus 13, which makes perfect sense on why the brain, when we try to model it, we use a nuclear power plant to produce the model of the prefrontal loop. And the entire thing is a battery operated 40 watts. You eat a sandwich, you're ready to think. <laughs> I like that. It's a challenge of through, throughput versus the amount of energy that is being used. Okay. So we keep going at the same old stuff 
we're going to get the same result. So uh, connectomes, um, the power uh, modulation of the prefrontal lobe of a cat, all of that stuff, it, it makes assumptions that are old. It's only recently when we try to understand that the brain is a quantum, at minimum, and I'm using the word quantum machine because of the expression um, that is available today to us, meaning that 10 years from now, the word might be obsolete. It might be actually this another phenomenon about the brain that we don't know. Well, thank you for, thank you for that very much. Um, Bogdan, uh, a different Bogdan has a few questions. Um, <clears throat> for the most, for most uh, psychiatric disorders, medication is being used. However, in most severe cases, uh, electroconvulsive therapy or deep brain stimulation is being used. Why does the latter one yield better results? And do you believe that in the future, the medication can be dropped completely and such procedures can be used? Of course, in a more friendly manner. Right. So it has to do with resolution. Um, when we treat with chemicals, we're doing a chemical path back, you know, just you know, flood everything with that agent and then let this agent take its course to do the inhibition or the excitation. When you use electricity, you have a very specific ordering of the neurons and um, uh, it's gated. And the flow causes things that are actually not functioning to be re-stimulated. Uh, DPS have the precision of uh, very specific one to the hundred thousand million neurons. The uh, chemicals doesn't have that precision. So the world of the future will have deep brain stimulation, brain computer interfaces that are doing non-intrusive deep brain stimulation uh, and deliver the energy to the precise areas and whatnot, and then uh, correct it. And that is approximately on the horizon of about one year away. Okay. Um, thank you for that question, uh, Bogdan. So uh, I know we started a little bit late, so we're about like four minutes over right now. Um, we have time for one more question. If you, uh, if someone has one more question, um, if not, um, I have a very quick question for you, Newton, which I was interested in, not neuroscience, um, but I was curious about the NGO C4 ADS. Um, and uh, providing data-driven analysis and evidence-based reporting on global conflict. I was wondering if you could just kind of just expand on that just for 30 seconds, because I found it uh, fascinating. I was really terrified when you said first that you're gonna ask a question that doesn't have to do with the brain, because if it had to do with women, I have absolutely no idea. How <laughs> yeah, no, 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 that's the uh, after dark sessions at Texylvania. We'll have those next year. <laughs> um, C4 ADS was a product of, um, a project uh, where I wanted to actually win a battle against terrorists and bad people, but actually without harming anyone. Okay. So we come up with a way that the economic, economic sanctions that um, is imposed or directed toward a, a national actor or a non-national actor can actually be refined to the level of precision of a courtroom.